In Psalm chapter 50 and verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Is the grandest thing through the ages wrong? Is the grandest thing for a mortal tongue? Is the grandest thing that the world and song our God is able to deliver thee? He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Welcome to our services this morning. We appreciate your presence this morning, especially if you're a guest with us. We encourage you to fill out one of the white cards on the back of the pew in front of you and just leave it in your seat, and we'll be able to pick that up after we are dismissed. We begin Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 o'clock for our morning worship service, 5 o'clock Sunday evening for our uh, evening worship service, and then Wednesday we have a class at 10 o'clock and 6.30 for our midweek Bible study. So if you're able to be at any of those times, we appreciate that very much. This time we'll enter into our worship service. <clears throat> James chapter 117, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variance or shadow of turning. I miss it with swift transition. John chapter 5 and verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That is, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us.
Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank thee, Lord, for this day that we can assemble to hear thy word, to sing praises to your name, and prayers for those that are in need, Lord, of your healing powers. Father, we're so thankful to have those back with us and amongst us, Lord, that have been out for different reasons, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for those that are not with us, that the day will come, Lord, that they will be here with us once again. Father, we're so thankful, Lord, for David and his family, for the messages he brings to us on a weekly basis, Lord. They're so uplifting, so knowledgeable, that each of us surely gain from his teachings. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the elders that work so tirelessly, Lord, to keep us on the right track to run the church, Lord, as you have them to. Father, we're so thankful, Lord, for our first responders that are on the job day in and day out, protecting us and taking care of us the police, the fire departments, the doctors, the nurses that tend to our needs, Lord. Father, we're so thankful, Lord, for the armed services, Lord, that those that are serving here in the U.S. and, and, and those abroad, Lord, that, that are away from their families. We pray, Lord, for their willingness to do so and we pray for those families that are left here to do without until their loved ones can return again we're so thankful lord for you watching over them protecting them father we're so thankful for your son who was so willing to go to the cross and shed his blood, Lord, for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Matthew 26 and verse 53, Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels?
In Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, verses 4 through seven, uh, 6, read as follows. Surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. When we gather around the Lord's table, the words of Isaiah ring loud and clear to us. The fact that all that Christ suffered and died, and he did it all for us. And the Lord's Supper is a memorial feast. We partake of the bread and the, and the fruit of the vine. And this is a reminder of those things that Christ suffered and died for all of us. Let's give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to thee that we can assemble here in this capacity. We can worship thee, the only true and living God. And that especially at this time, as we gather around this table, that we can center our thoughts and our minds upon the death that thou hast died for us. We are thankful for this bread, which typifies and represents the body of our Lord and Savior. And we are grateful for the sacrifice that thou hast made for us. Bless us and forgive us in Christ's name. Amen. Let's give thanks for the cup. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this cup, which represents the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross by our Lord and Savior. Bless us as we partake. Forgive us in Christ's name. Amen. Did everyone have access to the bread and fruit of the vine? That concludes the Lord's Supper. But we do want to, uh, okay. All right, it's been taken care of. <clears throat> Let's pause for just a moment. Our elders have placed a plate in the very back of the building and to my right as you go out the building. And you can drop your contribution in there. Because that we're, we do not pass the plates anymore doesn't make it any uh, less important. In fact, our giving is very important because <clears throat> it really represents and typifies what kind of a heart that we have. And uh, that's what the Lord wants us to realize. He wants us to give. He wants us to give as he has blessed us. And as we look around, we can see that uh, as a people that God has truly blessed us. And we're grateful for that. Let's give thanks for the offering. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We are so grateful that thou hast given us the opportunity and the willingness to work and to do those things so that we will have the sufficiency of funds that we can support the church and that we can uh, live and do the things that uh, we like to do our father we are grateful for this congregation and for the way that it gives and for the grateful hearts that are represented here and we pray that thou would continue to Bless them and bless us all that as we give that we will be laying by in store 
giving as thou hast prospered us. Bless us to this end and forgive us, we ask in the name of Christ. Amen. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 25, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. If you're able, we ask you to please stand as we sing this song. We praise the old God for the Son of our for Jesus. February the 8th of this year at a small college in Wilmore, Kentucky, a revival broke out, lasted for about 16 continuous days, nonstop from what I understand, with people coming and going. The name of the college was Asbury University. And this event has been called by various people in various publications a religious awakening or a God is love takeover. Now I have some questions about this revival, but I want to tell you a little bit more about it first. It happened apparently spontaneously after chapel one day at this school, this college, Asbury University, is associated with the Wesleyan tradition, the Wesleyan church. They're a holiness organization. After chapel one day, some students spontaneously, a a large group of them apparently stayed, didn't disperse, didn't go back to their rooms or to their classes or wherever, but just stayed and continued worshiping. And that That emotion just overflowed throughout the campus, throughout the community, and people from all over the world, as many as 70,000 people traveled to this little school, this little campus in Kentucky over that period of 16 days to participate in this revival. The popularity and the fame of it, you may have seen pictures of the Asbury Revival a couple of months ago, but that was helped spread by social media. There were TikTok videos that received as many as 63 million views of this event. It seems that one student confessed sin and an emotional spirit just overwhelmed the place. And I'm sure there were many who participated and who were there who were sincere 
who were worshiping God in the fullness of their hearts. But I have some questions. I have some, some problems with what went on there. First of all, there didn't appear to be any preaching. From what I could gather, what I could ascertain, it was simply worship, as what the world thinks of worship. Um, singing praises. There were, I understand, if I, if I understand correctly, instruments involved. Uh, but that's to be expected. But it was just that, for that long period of time, maybe praying, but, but no preaching, no teaching, no examining God's Word. And another problem that I have with what took place was apparently there were some leaders and participants in this revival who identified as LGBTQ. And again, just uh, we, we love and, and want to teach the truth to people who believe that way and have made that choice in their lives, but certainly... That would be an issue for them to lead in a public way in a worship service. It seems that in this revival, they were attempting intentionally intentionally to recreate maybe the atmosphere or the events that we read about in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the apostles and they began to speak with other tongues and it was a... It was certainly an emotional scene and a day on which 3,000 gave their lives to Jesus and responded to the gospel were baptized in his name to have their sins washed away. It seems that this was an attempt to recreate that atmosphere. Even the song that we just sung associates revival with spirit and with fire and that's what, that's what it seems was the intent with this Revival. Asbury University is known for their revivals. And so it makes me question and makes me wonder how spontaneous this event actually was. Apparently similar outbreaks have occurred in 1905, 1907, 1921, 1950, 1958, 1970, 1992, and 2006. In fact, from what I read and what I studied on this, the revival in 1970 at Asbury University was formative in the Jesus movement that was popular during the 1970s. In fact, the revivals at Asbury have been credited with influencing and shaping the spiritual landscape of our nation over the years. And so what I want us to wonder, what to question, what I want us to think about this morning is what is true revival? Is what took place at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky back in February of this year an example of the kind of revival that we see in Scripture? What is true revival? What is revival? What does revive mean? How does it occur? What are the effects of a revival? And who needs to be revived? Those are the questions we're going to ask about revival this morning. Before we get to those questions, I want us to notice a couple of passages in the book of Psalms. To illustrate the fact that our God is a God who revives. We serve a God who wants to bring to life those that are unliving, those who are dead those who have fallen away and forsaken Him. He wants to revive. Psalm 85. And we'll begin reading in verse 4. But really we we should look at the whole psalm. Psalm 85, beginning in verse 4. Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. He says, turn us. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? He's angry with them at the time. Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Notice that the rejoicing follows the revival. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us 
thy salvation. Just keep those words in mind. Go now to Psalm 138. One thirty-eight, and we'll notice beginning in verse six. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Humility is contrasted with pride here, in the heart of one that is seeking to follow God. Verse seven, though I walk in the midst of trouble. Thou wilt revive me. This is a humble heart that knows it is walking in the midst of trouble and knows that God is the one who can and will revive him. Crying out for revival with humility. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. Surely our God is a God who revives, who wants to revive those who have fallen asleep, to use a biblical term, those who have left their first love. But the first question then that we want to ask is, what is revival? What does revival mean? That was interesting. Revive means to make alive again. It means to restore to life or consciousness. One who has passed out needs to be revived. We perform CPR on those that need to be revived. Revival means to come back to a living state. A person was alive, they were conscious, and then they died. Or they lost consciousness and they need to be brought back. That's the idea of revival. It's not the same as being born anew, being born the first time. It's not the same as the idea of understanding based upon our hearing of the Word of God, believing it, repenting of our sins, confessing the sweet name of Jesus Christ and being baptized to have our sins washed away. Revival is not necessarily the same as obeying the gospel for the first time. Revival is... A restoration. It's bringing back to a previous state. And I want us to consider, we're not going to go through these examples in detail just yet, but I just want to point out a couple of examples of revival that we will be examining as we go through here. You might want to be turning to Second Chronicles chapters 34 and 35. Josiah may have been the greatest king that Israel, that Judah ever had. Maybe even exceeding David in the righteousness of his heart, in the love that he had for God. All the other kings are compared to David, but Josiah is at least on an equal with David. The two nations, Israel and Judah, had roughly 19 kings each. After Saul, David, and Solomon ruled over and reigned in a united kingdom because of Solomon's infidelity, because of the corruption in his heart as a result of the wives that he married, God divided the nation into two. The northern ten tribes, Israel, and the southern two tribes, which were called Judah. Neither nation had very many good kings. The northern nation, Israel, had none. No good kings in their entire history. They were taken into Assyrian captivity and never returned. They ceased to exist as an independent nation. The southern nation had about six good kings. They were taken into Babylonian captivity. And when the Babylonian captivity was over, all 12 tribes were represented when they returned to Jerusalem. Of those good kings, Josiah may have been the greatest. And in these chapters, we're going to notice that Josiah led a revival the likes of which had never been seen in Israel. He was a king. He was a leader. The people looked to him. And he led a revival. When they went into Babylonian captivity, it was to cure them of their idolatry. The idolatry that 
Solomon had introduced into the nation that Ahab and Jezebel had just caused to increase exponentially. That was so common in the promised land. God wanted to purify them, to purge this idolatry from them. And he was successful. He knew that would work. He took them away into Babylon. They, Jerusalem was destroyed. And the remnant that stayed faithful was allowed to return. And so in Ezra and Nehemiah, what we, what we read about is a revival. There were three carryings away and there were three returns from that captivity to restore the temple, the law, and the walls of Jerusalem. They were reviving what it meant to be a Jew. They were reviving worship in the temple. Ezra and Nehemiah lead this revival as well. We're going to look at those two examples of, of revival as we go through. So revive means to restore to a previous condition, to a condition of life, of living, of consciousness. That relationship with God that we once had, that we once enjoyed after we obeyed the gospel, we fell away from it. Revival means that we are going to be restored to that relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now, how does revival happen? Is it simply a matter of emotion overwhelming us? The Spirit of God being poured out like on the day of Pentecost? That's not what we see in these examples of revival that we're going to notice in Scripture. What we're going to learn is that revival is always associated with hearing God's Word. That's how revival takes place. That's how revival starts. By hearing the message of truth. By hearing the gospel for us today. Second Chronicles chapter 34. Notice beginning in verse 14. We find during this time, the temple had been neglected. Worship was not taking place in Jerusalem. They had forgotten the law of Moses. What they were supposed to do, the kinds of sacrifices, the kind of feasts they were to be observing, no one knew. Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 14. When they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. They were repairing the temple. They were rebuild, They were um, patching up the temple. It had fallen into disrepair. And he says, all that's been taken care of. Verse 17, And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen. He's just trying to get through this. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes and the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Asaiah, the servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. When they found the book, they hadn't read it or heard from it in a long time, many years. When Josiah heard the words, he tore his clothes, he fell down on his knees, and he said, Go inquire of the Lord. What are we going to do? What should we do now? We know that the Lord's wrath is against us because we've not been worshiping him the way that we should, the way that we once did. Josiah is going to lead this revival. Drop down now to verse 24. They go to Huldah the prophetess, and she tells them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king 
of Judah, verse 26, And as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so shall ye say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which thou hast heard. All the emphasis is on hearing the words of the book of the law. It wasn't because of some outpouring of an emotional spirit. It is a response to hearing the words of God. Verse 27, Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God when thou heardest the words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rent thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. The revival that Josiah began, that he invoked, was as a response of hearing the word of God. Josiah would go on to tear down all the images of the idols in the land. He was prophesied when the, when the nation was divided in two, and Jeroboam became the king over the northern nation and built the two altars at Dan and Bethel, he was prophesied, Josiah was prophesied by name to be the one who would come and destroy the altar that Jeroboam had made when the nation first divided. He did that. He ground up all, the, all of the idols, all the altars, all those objects of worship, and he restored, he revived worship of Jehovah God in Israel. But it wasn't enough to prevent the captivity that God was bringing upon His people. They still went into Babylonian captivity, but not during Josiah's time. He did succeed in postponing it a while. But they went into captivity, and in captivity they were completely purged of their idolatry. But then they had to return. And they had to restore. They had to learn once again after 70 years in Babylon, they had to learn once again how to worship. What God wanted from them. Worship had to be revived. So notice Nehemiah chapter 8. They're returning. They're rebuilding. They're working. They have a mind to work. But they have opposition. Their opponents are trying to prevent them from completing the tasks of rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the walls. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and of all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, from the morning until midday, you can cover a lot of ground in reading for at least four hours. There's a lot that you can read, a lot that you can hear, a lot that you can learn in that amount of time. He read from morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. They're listening. They're hearing the word of God in its proper place, in its proper application for the first time in their lives. Notice now in verse 8, Ezra, Nehemiah, these other men that they had help assisting them, so they read in the book of the law of God distinctly. They just let the word of God speak. They just read what it said to the people. They could understand for themselves. They read it distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the re reading. They explained to the people that they needed reviving, that they had not been worshiping, that there was a restoration of proper worship that needed to take place, and the people responded. During the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, the revival is seen in that the people, in response to hearing the words of the book of the law, they put away their strange wives. They had intermarried with the Babylonians in captivity, they broke up families because that was what God wanted them to do. That seems strange. That seems hard to believe. But that was part of their covenant relationship with God. They put away their strange wives. They renewed the covenant. They agreed to it. They confessed sins. They kept the feasts once again. They rebuilt the wall. They had this mind to work all because they heard the word of the Lord. 
in Josiah's time, we find that they kept a Passover feast like had not been observed in Israel since the days of Samuel. Samuel was the prophet who anointed Saul, the first king, who anointed David. And they had not kept a proper Passover feast since the days of Samuel. Josiah revived the observance of the Passover. What we learn from these examples is that true revival, real revival, is a response to hearing the truth of God's Word. It always is. It isn't just some spontaneous emotion that overwhelms us. It's not the Spirit working directly upon our hearts and minds, speaking in some small, still voice to us individually. That's not what causes or prompts revival. Revival is a response to hearing God's Word. Now, that's not what happened at Asbury, but that's what we see in Scripture. Our next question is, what are the results then of revival? Once revival has taken place, what happens then? In those passages in Psalms that we looked at, what we see here in Second Chronicles in the life of Josiah and also in the lives of Ezra and Nehemiah, we see that restoration is part of revival, the confession of sins, the confession that we had fallen away. We had stopped doing what we were once doing. We had died in the eyes of the Lord. We were spiritually dead. The confession of those sins is part of revival. Forgiveness of those sins because we have turned, as Psalm 85 mentions, because we turn back to God, our sins are taken away. What we also see is a joy and enthusiasm. We see that spirit taking place, being renewed and being revived within us because we heard the word of the Lord. But these are things that follow revival, not precede them. The joy and the enthusiasm is not what leads to revival. Revival takes place and then that joy, that enthusiasm, that passion, that spirit, that fire for the Lord is renewed. Restoration, confession of sins, Forgiveness of those sins, those are things that are results of revival, not things that come before a revival. Just want to point that out. The next question we want to ask then is, who needs to be revived? The answer is, the dead. Those who are dead need to be made live again. Now this can apply both to congregations and individuals. There were congregations in the first century that had already become dead. And Jesus addresses them directly in the last book of Scripture, in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Jesus directly addresses the, the seven churches of Asia. And especially we notice in chapter 3 verse 1 what he says to the church at Sardis. Jesus says unto the angel of the church in Sardis, right, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. The church as a whole had already died because they had stopped hearing, stopped listening to the word of God. They had fallen away. They had left their first love. They needed to be restored. And that's what Jesus says to them. Remember. Watchful, be watchful, strengthen the things that remain. Be restored to that relationship you once had. Otherwise, you will be taken away. Your candlestick will be taken away. Your names will be removed. Now, we have to ask ourselves, do we as a congregation need reviving? Are we in this condition? Are we in this position that the seven churches in Asia were in? And I want to tell you, in my four months here now, I think we're in a stage of revival. I think we've been through a period of death, of decay, of separating wheat from chaff. And what I see now are signs of revival here. Of people who are remembering, who are desiring to be restored, who want to reestablish that relationship, that covenant that they were once part of. I think that we as a congregation are in 
a period of revival. Congregations go through life cycles. And I think that's where we are now. We're in a time of restoration. And it's something to be excited about. It's something about which we can have joy and enthusiasm. A fire. We can have that emotion because revival is happening here. But I want us to go to Ezekiel chapter 37 as we consider that on an individual basis we have to think about whether we need to be revived as well. What Ezekiel sees here in Ezekiel 37 applies to both. His image here that what he what happens is is a symbol of what's going to happen when the church takes the place of Israel as God's people. But it's also an example, it's also a symbol of what happens to us individually. When we have fallen away, when we have forsaken God, after becoming a Christian, after confessing our faith in Him and obeying the gospel, but then we fall away, what we have here in Ezekiel 37 also symbolizes what we go through when we're revived by hearing the truth. Notice Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning in verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. Lo, they were very dry. This is the valley of dry bones. Nothing but dead people as far as the eye can see. No meat left on the bones. It's a dry and brittle place. There's no life left. He said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? If it were up to you, could you bring these bones back to life? Is it just some emotion, some desire that you have in your heart? You just make that choice, that decision. You're overwhelmed by that emotion and you come back to life son of man can you make these bones live is the idea Ezekiel says O Lord God thou knowest it's not up to me if you want them to live I suppose they can but it's not because I can make them live again he said unto me verse 4 prophesy unto these bones and say unto them O ye dry bones hear the word of the Lord he's preaching to dead people Nothing but bones. He says, tell them, prophesy to them, tell them the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Breath is what we have in our hands. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is inspired. It's breathed out by God. This is the breath of God in written form. That's what we have in our hands when we hear it. It brings us back to life. I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live. It doesn't matter how dead we are. How far we've turned away from our relationship with God. No matter what sins we've committed. No matter how dry our bones are spiritually. God can put breath in us and cause us to live when we hear the words of the Lord. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. They're not alive yet. It's an exciting thing. It's, it's an emotional experience when we hear the word of the Lord and that revival begins to take place. Verse 9, Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, say, son of man, and say to the wind, again, the breath, the wind, the word of God. Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. We're in the midst of a revival here. How's your relationship with God? Are you in a state of spiritual decay, spiritual death? The bones within you spiritually have dried up to the point that there's no life in them. The Word of God 
can revive you. You've heard it this morning. If you've never obeyed the gospel, this is the time to be born again, to be born alive into the family of God, become a child of God by obeying the gospel. But if you know you've fallen away, you know there are sins in your life, you know that right now, in the eyes of God, you're dead, you can be revived. Asking for prayers, confessing sins, that's all there is to it. Because you've heard the Word of God, it has revived that spirit within you. It's exciting, it's emotional, and now's the time to do it. If you need to respond, won't you come forward while we stand and sing? this morning and I'm just going to read to you what she's written over the past year I have been dealing with some very serious personal issues and it has caused me to lose focus on priorities I ask for your forgiveness patience and prayers as I move forward 